Jim was born in Texas. He is a Texan. He was born in Lacoste, Texas, 20 miles southwest of San Antonio. He went to college at Texas A&M in Kingsville. He got um, a BS there and an MS in 74. He majored in math and minored in physics and spent his um, career at NASA. Jim began his restoration experience in 2007 as he was getting ready to retire from his named aerospace rat race, he was looking for something to do with his time. His wife guided him to Armand Bayou Prairie Friday, and this group is responsible for the prairie restoration activities that he has been participating in ever since. As time passed, other opportunities in restoration presented themselves. Rangers at Sheldon Lake State Park contacted Prairie Friday for volunteers about starting a prairie restoration program there. He continued that program until 2010. And then the lead for the restoration effort at Texas City Prairie Preserve needed some, the lead had stepped down and they needed somebody else for the leadership role. So Jim stepped up for that. In April of 2012, Prairie Friday volunteers were approached by the ranger from San Jacinto Battleground um, to begin a restoration program at the park. So Jim started supporting that. So Jim's support of Armand Bayou, Texas City Prairie, and San Jack continue to this day. Currently, his main task in the restoration effort consists, consists of plant propagation. He uses greenhouses at the College of the Mainland, Armand Bayou, San Jacinto Battleground to produce seedlings for the prairie. In 2008, Jim became a Galveston Bay Area chapter of the Texas Master Naturalist. And during his tenure with GBAC, he has accumulated over 20,000 volunteer service hours. And last week, Jim was nominated and then selected as the Native Prairie Association of Texas Houston chapter volunteer of the year. So, Let's listen to Jim. Thank you, Beverly. Okay, uh, again, I'm going to give you uh, what I do in the area of prairie restoration, which may differ from what other people do, and that's, that's okay because prairie restoration includes a tremendous amount of activities. But before I start, I would like to thank Beverly and Debbie for helping me organize this presentation. I'm not very good at PowerPoint and they are whizzes at it. So I thank them in advance. And so let's go ahead and, and go on with the, uh, with the presentation. Next. I plan to cover five things today. Uh, the first one is an introduction into the coastal tall grass prairie. Uh, the second is uh, the feature of the prairie work sites where I work or I am involved with. Uh, the third thing is uh, restoration resources, the approaches that I take to, to get the prairies res uh, restored where I work. Uh, the fourth thing is the restoration approaches. These are the different ways in which we can move the plants from wherever into the prairie. And then I'm going to give you a summary of the restoration efforts that we have done since uh, 2007. The coastal tall grass prairie is very easy to remember. It is uh, near the coast. It used to extend from the coast to about 50 miles inland. And it was all the way from south of Corpus Christi into Louisiana. And this prairie was dominated by tall grasses, of course, it's in the name there. Uh, Eastern gamma grass, big blue stem, little blue stem, yellow Indian grass and switch grass were the dominant grasses in this coastal prairie. Uh, there were also some grasses that we call intermediate, which are really not as dominant. And of course there were forbs, which are your blooming plants that make the prairie very colorful. Uh, restoration involves many things and doesn't necessarily have to be in the middle of a prairie. This is an example of gamma and 
and, and switchgrass along one of the roads at the San Jacinto Battleground. In fact, you can see the monument in the background. So it's restoration efforts where you need to put the plants. This is the restoration effort that we did at the Texas City Prairie Preserve. And it's kind of hard to imagine it as a restoration because what it really is is a seed production facility. These plants were planted with the sole purpose of providing seeds and plants for restoration in other sites. And you can see the, the switch grass is in full seed mode right there. And the grasses to the right are Eastern gamma grass. So again, there were about 9,000 plants that went into this, uh, into this seed production facility. Many times we go ahead and restore a prairie by planting forbs. In this case, these are Texas coneflowers at the Armin Bayou Nature Center. And the trick is, of course, to introduce these plants and then hopefully uh, by seeds, they will go ahead and increase. And you can see that there's a, a lot of nice plants in this immediate restoration area. Uh, these are Maximilian sunflowers and they were planted along the east, the, the entry road at the Texas City Prairie Preserve. You can see the education building in the background along with one of the facility trucks. And uh, Maximilian sunflowers are beautiful plant to put anywhere. Uh, some people don't really like them because they seem to kind of take over. So if you like taken over by yellow flowers, this is probably your plant. Another forb, uh, in fact, you have this on your website, is the spider lily. Uh, in this particular case, it is also near the Texas City Prairie Preserve. Uh, it is a, it, it, it kind of reminds you of a, of a spider web with a little extensions in the area there. And so uh, this is really, this plant with, or this field was not restored by us, but we used the seeds to restore other areas. Sometimes a restoration effort doesn't really happen in the prairie. In this particular case, it's at Westbrook Intermediate. We had a task, um, with the Junior Master Naturalist Program for our chapter. And we put in a, a prairie plot for the school. And uh, I go back maybe twice a year to check on the plants and possibly put some more plants into the prairie. So this shows the students exactly what a small prairie would look like. And we have already covered some of these. Uh, the sites that I work with, I started in 2007 at Arm and Bayou. Uh, the same year, we went to Sheldon Lake State Park. In 2010, uh, I went to the Texas City Prairie Preserve because the lead there had to uh, stop work. And so I went ahead and took over the leadership there. And when I went to Texas City, I stopped working at Sheldon Lake State Park. It was a they both work on the same day, so I had to stop one and start the other one. At the San Jacinto Battleground, we started that in 2012, and, and I continue to work that even to the present time. Galveston Island State Park is a, a little bit unique for me. I never really worked there. Well, I worked there one time, but I never really worked there, but uh, the person that led that activity was also leading some of the activities at Texas City. So I just kind of took it under my wing and, and kept track of the activities that they do there. And there's really many, many more in the local area, little pocket prairies and prairies that we do. Uh, it's at schools. Uh, there's an activity at Sylvan Rodriguez State Park. Uh, there's the Bayside Project in Baycliffe. There's EIH. We even had a planting activity in Brazos Bend State Park, although it's my understanding now they have their own volunteer group that takes care of that. Uh, we've supported Exploration Green, and I also found my way over to the Deer Park Prairie. And these are just a few of the restoration activities that are going on in the immediate area. I usually don't get into the northern part of the Clear Lake area 
And so the furthest north that I will go is, is San Jacinto and Sheldon. So I, a lot of my talk will be oriented toward the southern part of that area. Now, my approach for restoring these fine places is I always go under the assumption that I'm going to have limited funding. Can't go out there and buy a lot of things, but we do buy enough to keep our activities going. I have been blessed with an extensive volunteer manpower. Uh, I've always been able to get resources, master naturalists, just plain people interested in the work that we do. And so I have been very lucky in that area. There's always an abundance of local seed sources where you can go out and gather seeds of many, many, many different types. Unfortunately, my uh, work schedule kind of prevents me from going out there and picking a lot of these. So I'm at the mercy of people that are very good at gathering seeds and I usually pay the, play the role of the poor beggar and they give me some. So anyway, that, that's how I get a lot of my seeds. I use very few vendor seeds from these seed companies. In fact, since I've been doing prairie restoration, I can recall only two instances where we used seeds that were procured by someone else and, and we went ahead and, and put them in the prairie. There's also a lot of mature plants that we use for rescue. And what that means is we go into the community and we actually dig out the plant and we bring it back to the site and then we process it there. So uh, there's uh, quite a few places where we can do that. Uh, usually nowadays, uh, we will rescue plants in areas that are getting ready to be destroyed, such as a parking lot or something like that. And I keep my seed inventory, actually I keep it for two years. So I keep the current year and the previous year and then any seeds older than that, I perch them and throw them in the prairie. The viability rate for the seeds will degrade if you keep them for very much longer of time, unless you put them in a very good temperature and humidity controlled environment. Okay, seed inventory. What do you need to get seeds? And, and I guess I'm preaching to the choir here because you guys already have so many people that gather seeds and know how to do it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Usually you need some buckets, some bags, some gloves, some clippers, scissors, or you can do it by hand. And you go out into the surrounding community and you select the seeds that you, that, that you need to collect. All the seeds that I use come within a 50 to 75 mile radius of the sites that I work at. So they are all local. Uh, the seeds can be either machine picked or picked by hand. Uh, machine picked, uh, there's basically one place that does that quite well and that's Texas City because they have made the investment to get machines that will pick the seeds and they also manage, the Nature Conservancy manages several sites where picking the seeds by machine is feasible. Uh, most of the seeds that I get, in fact, almost all of them, are handpicked by volunteers. Once the seeds are picked, uh, I go ahead and clean them and I dry them as soon as possible. And what I mean by clean and dry, uh, I, I go ahead and remove the stems and leaves that may have been gathered with the seeds so that if you leave the seeds and those things together, you may start getting some mold into your seeds and that'll degrade the quality of it. I usually clean them by my garage and I have attracted some brown and moles to, they like to hang around and eat the bugs or anything that comes out of those things. And so they're, I find that they are very, very loyal in, 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 during my seed cleaning days. So once you clean them, you store them in cloth bags or paper bags, or sometimes I leave them in aluminum trays with the top open so that they can, quote, breathe. Uh, you don't want to completely enclose them in something where no air can get in and out. Again, that can degrade the, that can degrade the seed, unless, of course, you put it in a, 
in an environment where the temperature and the humidity is controlled. Uh, you can also procure seeds from a reliable vendor. Uh, again, I, I do not do that. If you do, there is nothing wrong with that. You think that you need to be sure that if you're going to buy seeds, make sure that the seeds are from the local area or they're targeted from the local area. I have seen an experiment at Texas City where they brought some seeds from Oklahoma and they did not do very well in the environment here, in the local environment. And my guess is that the seeds from the local environment won't do very good in Oklahoma either. I'll show you some of the seeds that we gather. Uh, the seeds that we see here are erect bactesia, some people call it bush pea. Uh, the, the seed that you gather are actually the seeds on the left, you grab them with your hand. Then I take these uh, to my seed cleaning facility, which is my garage, and I crack the shells open and I remove the shell casings and I end up with the seeds or what they look like on the right. So this is Baptisia. Another favorite of mine is uh, basket flower. Uh, basket flower is a purple flower that blooms around May or June. And the bottom of it looks like a, a woven basket, hence the name basket flower. The seeds are embedded within the flower and you kind of work your way at them with your finger and the seeds you will see on the right. Now, basket flower has a lot of lint or fibers that get on you and they itch like crazy. So, A, it's best to clean it outdoors and you're probably gonna have to take a quickie shower after you finish working with these because they do tend to itch a lot. Unfortunately, with my first two uh, uh, slides on the seeds, I didn't include something that gives you an idea what the size of the seed looks like. So I decided to stick a nickel here. Uh, these are Texas cone flowers, and Texas cone flowers are a lot of fun, not only to gather, but to clean. You remove the seeds along the center of the seed head, and they will come out. Uh, a lot of fun to remove them, and you get a lot of seeds, and they're fun to pick. Again, there's some little worms in the center of the seed head sometimes, and I throw those at the, again, my favorite anoles, and they'll go ahead and gobble them up. So I have some royal anoles that watch me clean the seeds. Uh, these are grasses that we, that, that we pick. The ones on the left are eastern gamma grass, and they have been equated sort of like early corn. And the seeds on the right are switchgrass. Both of these grasses are part of the coastal tall grass prairie. The thing about the gamma grass is uh, they tend to be eaten by mice, rats, and birds. So you kind of have to beat them to the source. And when I see the, these, uh, there was a mouse or something in the greenhouse and he kept pulling the seeds away. So you have to be careful with that. Another type of seed that we gather are spider lily seeds, and you can see they look like olives. And these are the plants that, uh, that bloom white and they resemble sort of like a spider web. Again, uh, it takes a lot of seeds in many cases to, to go ahead and restore the prairie. And this is the example at the Texas City Prairie Preserve of the seed storage facility. Again, Texas City relies a lot on seeds because they have the machines to harvest them. They also have the machines to store them. And this is primarily what they do to restore their prairie. You can see that the seeds are in white uh, cloth bags. And on the stand at the center of the picture, you'll see some paper bags. Uh, the seeds are labeled with the day they were picked, the location they were picked, and exactly what they are. Now, in order to keep the seeds in the best shape possible, uh, they have a dehumidifier and an air conditioner that, suppose, that supports this. And they like to keep the temp some of the temperature and the humidity at less than or equal to 100. And that will ensure that the seeds stay in a fairly good viable rate. So spring inventory, sometimes when we do our restoration activity, 
we don't really go as far back as the seeds. We grab something called a sprig. And what a sprig is, is just a piece of an adult plant. And in order to get your inventory going for sprigs, you're going to need a sharpshooter, which is a, a thin digging uh, a shovel. You'll need tubs for carrying things. You need a pruning saw for separating the, the roots and the, the pieces of the plant a knife, screwdriver, buckets, uh, and when you plant, you'll need a sharpshooter and something called a dibble, which is a metal rod with a, a kind of like a flat end on one place with a, an extension so you can jump on it to dig it into the ground. And then you wiggle it back and forth and that's how you create the hole for the sprig. Uh, plants, all plants are rescued from the local area. Uh, in fact, when we started uh, Prairie Restoration in the 2007 era, probably 90% of the plants that we generated came from sprigs. And basically what that meant is that we went into the local community and dug out a plant and brought it back to the site. Now, if you dig out the plant, you go back next year and it's not going to be there. So. It took us a couple of years to figure out that if we kept digging all the plants in the local area, we're gonna run out of them. So that's where we started moving more and more towards the seeding approach. Uh, once you uh, rescue the plant from the, from the area, you bring it back to the site and you divide it into smaller pieces and they're stored or staged in, tub, in tubs and you have to have water covering the roots so that the plant won't be uh, degraded. The pieces of the plant dinner can either be planted directly into the prairie or they can be potted in one gallon containers to allow them to grow. I always like to have the plants planted as soon as possible. I prefer that they be used, whether you're gonna plant it or whatever, within a week. Certainly, I do not like when they go more than three weeks. Uh, the quality of the plants starts degrading. So I usually like to time it and plan my activities so that the sprigs are used right away. This is an example of a rescued uh, piece of Eastern gamma grass. As you can see, someone went into the community and, and, and dug a chunk of gamma grass. And the tub that you see to the right is what we used to carry it. Uh, Sometimes the grasses that we rescue are pretty wet, so you don't want to put anything like this just straight in, your, in the trunk of your car. So we put it in one of those tubs. And uh, when we're ready to use the grass, then we have one of our volunteers that looks amazing me like me. But uh, what, what he does in this particular case, he's using a knife to separate the pieces of the eastern gamma grass and 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 sometimes you can you can use the knife sometimes you can use your bare hands uh, i don't use my bare hands too often because the next day you can't lift up your arms and then sometimes in the case of switchgrass for ex for example it's helpful to use like a pruning saw because the roots on the switchgrass are just unbelievably tough to get through. So there are certain tools that we generally use to, uh, to go ahead and separate the grasses. The grasses that you see here will be put in one, these particular ones will be put in one gallon containers. In fact, in the upper right, you can see some of our volunteers that are working to put these into one gallon containers. This is the first of our restoration approaches. I generally think that, seem to think that there are four based on my experience in this area. And the first one is we restore a prairie with seeds. Now, I can tell you because of the availability of seeds and the investment in the equipment necessary to do that Texas City Prairie Preserve is really the only one that is doing that in the local area uh, with any degree of success and with it any, any large amount of seeds. Uh, the way that that is done is you gotta prepare the target site 
And that is done by a series of herbiciding and plowing. What you want to do is you want to eliminate the competition as much as possible for the seeds before you go ahead and throw them in the prairie. Recommendation time for the series of herbiciding and plowing is 18 to 24 months. Well, 18 to 24 months is a very long time, and I really have never seen anyone spend that much amount of time in preparing the site for that. So usually people spend uh, less than a year to get that done, and then they go ahead and sow the machine, sow the seeds either by hand or by machine. Again, Texas City uh, has a machine that will do that. It's like a seed drill that puts the seeds just about uh, on the surface of the ground. And then you always have volunteers, no matter what side, if you have extra seeds, they will do it by hand by just scattering them out into the prairie. Uh, water is advisable if available, but most of the time where these uh, seeding activities occur are quite a ways from a water source unless you have like two miles of hoses, you know, you're probably not going to want to do that. Texas City has made the investment in a tanker that they can use to go over the, uh, the seeded area and water it. So there's the, if you don't have that watering mechanism, the best thing to do is to try to, uh, to plant the seeds around the rainfall and then hope for the best. One of the things about the seeds a lot of times because of the competition, it's kind of hard to assess the success of your seeding operation. And so uh, you're not quite sure just how good you are, or how good you have been in that effort. Many times it'll take years before you can notice the effects of your seeding operation. The second approach for restoration is the sprigs. And again, the sprigs are something that we went out and dug and then we brought it back to the site and cut it up. I always prefer that the target area be semi-prepared. And we do that by mowing it. Uh, and then we can go out and plant the sprigs with a sharpshooter or with a dibble. Uh, we put the actually live plant into the ground. And uh, hopefully, we hope for the best that it will go ahead and take hold. Of course, if it doesn't rain for about six weeks to two months, chances are the sprigs aren't going to be doing very well. It just that's just the nature of the game. Water, if possible, or plant where it's wet or after it has rained, and that gives the plants a chance. Now, I was not a prime believer in sprigs planting them directly into the field because I did not think that they would do very well unless it rained and continued to rain. In many cases, we, of course, can't control that. So we had a high school class go out and plant a field with quite a few of the sprigs for switchgrass. And I was just amazed in the fall when the seeds uh, appear on the plants, how many of the plants actually took hold and how many seeded. I was, I was amazed at the number that, that made it. Again, these grasses are pretty tough. And I guess that's why they were so, so successful in the coastal tall grass prairie, it's just amazing to me that so many of them survive. And that doesn't mean they all will do that, but at least in that particular case, they did. And that planting event was at Sheldon Lake State Park. Uh, again, I wanted to remind that sprigs can go directly into the field and they, they can also be moved to one gallon containers where they will be pot planted later on. So we have seeds and we have sprigs, and now we're going to go to the potted plant. Uh, the potted plant approach is the most common uh, of the methods that we use for restoring the prairies. Of the five sites that I mentioned earlier, four of the five use this as their primary approach. Uh, tools of the trade, you're going to have to have a greenhouse or some place where you can water uh, the seeds and the seedlings. You need potting soil. You need uh, to grow the seedlings. You need to 
plastic trays that we use for germination of, of the seeds. Uh, you need some work tables, some pots, some shovels, some topsoil. All of that comes into play in the generation of the potted plants. The, the effort begins by filling the plastic trays with potting soil. And generally what we do is we heavily seed these trays so that we can get a lot of plants out of them. Uh, we don't put one or two or five seeds per tray cell. Uh, as far as the, the, the type of soil that I use, I use a product called Bacto. I like it because it doesn't have a lot of, uh, a, a lot of wood in it. I also add perlite to it. But any, any, any potting soil can be used for the generation of the seedlings if you are inclined to do that. So generally, when we see the trays, this is an example of heavily seeding a tray. Now you can see that there's probably about 20 seeds or more per cell. Uh, and so this particular seed is, is a rosin weed. It's a plant that grows about two to three feet tall and it has a yellowish blossom on it. But we go ahead and seed them heavily and later on, we'll, we'll divide them up and thin them out. One of the things that we do in the lower right-hand corner, there is a tag on it that lets us know what kind of seed we have, we have, we're trying to germinate. Now, the tags that I use are just pieces of old Venetian lines. And so that comes in, in keeping with my being cheap and not spending a lot of money on a lot of fancy things. So this is an example of a heavily seeded tray with rosin weed in it. Here's another tray, and this one has iron weed in it. In fact, you can see in the upper left that it's got iron weed in the thing. Uh, we go ahead and identify the seeds that we put in there because sometimes, especially with the grasses, it's very difficult to identify, especially when they're small. So you can see this is an example where the seeds are germinating and there's quite a few of them per, per each cell. You've got 24 cells in this one. And so you can estimate that you probably have maybe 20 to 50 plants in each one of these cells. And they're still germinating. So a fair assessment would be that we could probably get 500 plants out of this particular tray from the time you seeded it to the time you see it like this, this is probably about 10 days for this particular seed. Spider lilies, uh, I usually uh, grow in, 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 in plastic trays with some holes at the bottom of it to, to drain the water. Uh, I put the spider lily seeds uh, side by side as close as I can. Then I go ahead and water them. And after about a week to 10 days, uh, you see that the spider lilies send out a white wormy looking thing if you'll see in the center there and that's basically the the the, the tap root that's going to become the root of the plant and it'll send it down and it'll sit there and you're wondering well is that all there is to spider lilies after about a week you'll see a green shoot comes up and that goes up so that completes the part of the spider lily that is underground and the part of the spider lily that is above the ground. And after about six weeks, this is what the spider lily would look like. Uh, you can see that some of the spider lilies that are kind of yellow looking, those didn't quite make it. And not every seed that we plant makes it. That's why we so heavily seed them so that if we put a hundred seeds in and we get, let's say, 30 plants, that's not a very bad average. Uh, sometimes you luck out and you get 100 seeds germinating and then you've got a problem because you got a whole bunch of seedlings on your hands and you don't know what to do with them. You know what I mean? I don't like to throw seedlings away. If I germinated it and I'm raising it, I want to do something with it. So uh, getting down to the third bullet, uh, after four to six weeks, the seedlings can be separated. And this is a process that we call lateral transfer. 
That means what we do is we take those heavily seated trays and we pop out a cell and we have volunteers that go out there and they divide them up and they put one plant or seedling per cell. And what that looks like, this is an example of one of our volunteers. In fact, she's one of your members. Uh, she has taken some yellow Indian grass seeds, seedlings, and she's dividing them up and she's put them into a tray, uh, one seedling per cell. And the reason I know it's yellow Indian grass, because if you look at the tag on the tray, that's in the right side of the, of the slide, you'll see it's yellow. So I use a yellow tag to signify yellow Indian grass. So she is doing lateral transfers and a close-up view, this is, not, this is not something that she had done. This is something someone else had done. This is what the results of a lateral transfer will look like. You will have one plant per one cell. Usually our trays are uh, five cells by 10. So there's usually about 50 cells in each one of the trays. Okay, this is an example of some of the, uh, some of the forbs and how many, some of the seedlings that we have divided up. Uh, these are Texas coneflowers and we, they have been dividing up where they have been uh, separated from a heavily seeded tray, lateral transfer into one plant per cell. Now, if you look closely, at some of the uh, cells, you will see that there are, there's more than one plant in there. What happens sometimes, we separate the seedlings and put them one per cell, and there are still seeds in the dirt that is brought in in the lateral transfer, and so we end up getting like four or five plants in that one cell. Uh, sometimes we divide it up before we go to one gallon containers and sometimes we just stick the whole cell in there. It varies. In the background, in, in the top of the slide, you can see some of the grasses that are growing there. And so uh, whether we have divided them up, in fact, everything should have been divided up, although it looks like some of the trays in the upper part of the display have more than one plant in it. This is what a greenhouse will look, or maybe it won't be as dirty. I cleaned the floor shortly after this because it was, they look kind of, kind of bad. I should have done it before. But this is what a working greenhouse looks like. This is my greenhouse that I use at the College of Mainland. And if you look at the lower part of the uh, slide, you will see some of the trays that are heavily seated and have not been worked. You will see some of the trays that you can't really see any, any growth in it, and you have some little seedlings, and then you will see some, you know, kind of toward the middle of the, uh, of the slide that are already large and probably ready to go on and, 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 and be moved to the site where they're going to be potted into one gallon containers. Okay. Now, you can see that some of these are rather large, now, this is not a common occurrence. Uh, this is called the results of the pandemic. Most of our sites were shut down. So when the site is shut down, you can't pull the seedlings to the site to pot them. So the seedlings just grow and grow and grow. It really makes the person that's managing the greenhouse look, look pretty good. You know, sometimes you you hurt your elbow just patting yourself on the back because God, I'm doing a good job on this one here. But anyway, there are instances where the good job does not always happen. This is my greenhouse at the San Jacinto Battleground. And if you look closely, some of the grasses look brown. And brown is a bad indicator for grasses because that either indicates they're dormant or they're dead. Anytime you use the D word, it's not a good sign. What happened here, this picture was taken in March of 2019. And we had a fire about a mile from the greenhouse at San Jacinto. 
and the site was closed. Unfortunately, now you're probably thinking, well, you know, with automatic watering system, why did the plants die? Well, unfortunately, the day before the fire, the staff at the site noticed a water leak and turned the water off. So for five to six weeks, nothing was watered at San Jacinto. When I was given permission to go in, I, the water still had not been repaired, so I started pulling my trays out as soon as I could. And you can see that there's some holes. These are the trays that, this is the way they looked on the second time that I was there. So what I do, I have experienced an instance before where I have lost watering to some of the seedlings. So what I did is I pulled all the trays and I took them to the Arm and Bayou Nature Center and I laid them out where I could give them some tender loving care. I watered the trays twice a day. And in some cases, believe it or not, some of the plants will come back and survive. It's like raising from the dead. However, in this case, after about five weeks, in looking at the trays, ignore the thing on the left, those are weeds, but these are the trays that I pull from San Jacinto. And if you look closely in the upper right, you will see a tray of spider lilies that came back. Now, why did they come back? Well, spider lilies seem to grow dormant around the May time frame, and they also have a bulb that allows them to last a little bit longer. So of the 34 trays that I had at the San Jacinto Battleground, 33 were a total loss, and only about 75% of the spider lilies survived. So not everything goes according to plans in prairie restoration. Sometimes you lose plants. And I don't think there's anyone in the immediate area that has probably killed more plants than Jim Duran. So that gives you an indication of just how good I really am. My mom always wanted me to, best, to be the best at something and I'm a good plant killer. Okay, let's go on. Once we have finished the lateral transfers and the uh, and the seedlings have grown a little more. In about four to eight weeks, the seedlings can be moved to one gallon containers and potted. So we'll take those to the, uh, what we will do is we will take them to the site so that we can go ahead and move them to one gallon containers. This is just basically some of our topsoil with the one gallon containers full of dirt. Uh, and our infamous sharpshooter. It's not rocket scientists. You add the dirt to the container. Then you take a tray of seedlings and you pull them out of the tray. I like to use a screwdriver to remove the seedling from the cell. Uh, some people like to squeeze the bottom of the cell, but sometimes that tends to damage the plastic tray. So in this particular case, uh, we have quite a few volunteers. It was taken at Arm and Bayou. And so we specialize. We have somebody that fills the pots with dirt. We have somebody that pulls the seedlings out of the tray. We have some people that put the seedlings into the pots. And then we have somebody that will go ahead and stage them. You can see the staging in the upper left. Those are some of the plants that have been staged up there. So this is an example of San Jacinto. There is a limited number of volunteers at San Jacinto. And you can see that we do it now. We don't pull all the, all the seedlings out of the tray. We do them one or two at a time, and then we pot them, and then we stage them. This is another one of our volunteers at Arm and Bayou, uh, and he has got a bunch of plants, and I'm not sure what that is, but it's probably ironweed. And what he has done, someone has pulled the plants out of the tray, or he is doing that, and, and then they are potting them in one gallon containers. And of course, this was taken after we returned from the uh, facility closed down because of the virus. 
So once we've moved them to one gallon containers, uh, we let them mature. They will grow, develop a better root system, and anywhere from two to six months, the mature plants can be moved into the prairie. Now, you'll notice there's a wide difference as to when the plants are ready. The grasses tend to get mature much faster. Their root system is much better than the blooming plants or the forbs. So the six month time frame is for some of the forbs because it takes them that long being staged on the ground to go ahead and develop the root system where they can be moved out into the prairie. This is what it looks like when we stage the plants in our staging area after they have been potted by the volunteers. Now, don't get your hopes up too high because a lot of the uh, green in the lower half of the uh, slide are actually weeds. Uh, this picture was taken after we returned on the first or second work day from coming back after the pandemic. And, and so there's so many live plants in there and there's some that don't quite make it. One of the things that I like to point out in the section of plants directly in front in the middle is that we do inventory of these plants that are on the ground. We do a quarterly inventory all the time. When we pot them, we keep track of them. When we plant them, we keep track of them. And so we align them. In this particular case, if you will count the pots, you will see that it's 10 rows and 10 columns. So when we inventory, it's very easy to say, instead of saying one, two, three, all the way up to 100, and then go to the next block, you just say 100, 200, 300. And so it allows us to know how many plants we got and allows us to better count them because we keep them dress right dress, so on like that. The next thing that we also have is in our staging area sometimes, we use a sprinkler and a timer that we use to go ahead and water these. These plants are watered twice a day. Right now, the sprinklers are set for 20 minutes because it's getting warmer. Pretty soon, I will go ahead and reset these to 25 minutes, and then eventually they'll go to half an hour. So all the sprinklers are set to offset from one another by half an hour. That way, the water pressure doesn't drop down in case two or three of these things come on at the same time. And again, this is an example, the one in the center front, it's not the plants, those are just weeds that we are going ahead and weeding. Uh, again, these are some of our miscellaneous grasses. Instead of 10 by 10, they are five by 10 or five by 20. In other words, in groups of 50 or in groups of 100, and again, uh, it comes in handy so that we can count uh, the number of plants that we have. At Arm and Bayou, we have troughs. These troughs were originally used for growing uh, California bulrush, and these were used in, the, in a grant that was restoring the shoreline along Arm and Bayou. When that grant ran out, then we decided to start using it for our spider lilies that we put in one gallon containers. Normally, spider lilies don't bloom in one gallon containers, but this was one of those years where a few of them did bloom. And so you can see the white blossoms on them. Now, we're not always very successful in, in the things that we do, as I have pointed out. And many times, in order for us to maintain these plants in the staging area, we have to take advantage of as many volunteers as we possibly can. And as I mentioned before, we're very lucky that we have an abundance of volunteers that are willing to weed, that are willing to do things. And here we have two of our volunteers that are attacking a vasey grass. It's an invasive grass. And so they decided to go ahead and take it upon themselves to dig around the roots of this plant and get rid of it. Again, Volunteers are key to our success, and we take every advantage that we can in using them. Sometimes we just employ a volunteer to keep a close eye on everything that we do. As you can see, this volunteer is keeping an eye on the spider lilies in the trough, 
and making sure that Jim Duran is pulling the weeds correctly. And as you can see, he's a little bit upset because there's a couple of weeds that I missed. Now, I like to do a lot of my work after hours, and I was working at about later in the evening when I saw this guy, and it wasn't too bad till he started making that sounds that baby alligators make when they're calling their mom. Well, it probably took me about two seconds to get out of that trough and look around to make sure that a six or seven foot mama wasn't hanging around. I never did find the mom, and I did see him about three times over a five-week period in this trough, and just like he magically appeared, and then he magically disappeared, and I don't, I don't know what happened to him. Once the plants have been staged, and they grow, and they're mature, then we get our crack planters that will take these mature plants and take them out into the prairie and plant them. You can see uh, our volunteers here. One is carrying pots that's going to be laid out in the prairie. And I can tell you from here that they are coneflowers and they are planting these near that area of Texas coneflowers that we saw earlier that was a field of yellow. The other volunteer has a sharpshooter that they use to dig the holes to put the plants into the ground. Here we have some more volunteers. Uh, again, this is post pandemic and they're laying out the plants so that they can plant them. And in the background, you will see that field of, of coneflowers. Now, what you try to do with these plants is you introduce them into the prairie and hopefully some will survive and start seeding and increasing the number of plants that you have. And that is what prairie restoration is all about. One point I want to make, you'll see the sharpshooter to the right of the second individual sticking in the ground. That is a good habit to get into. If you lay your tools on the ground in a grassy area, you will probably lose it and never find it again until they mow and the, the mower kicks it up and grinds it up. So it's a very good habit that our planters have gotten into to stick the, uh, the sharpshooters in the ground where you can find them. And here we have two more volunteers. The one in the back looks like he's given the victory sign. And the one in the front is just kind of waiting for some more plants or something like that. They both have their sharpshooters and they're both kind of, kind of leaning on. The fourth method that I use to restore the prairie is something called seed balls. Uh, seed balls are probably the most fun activity that you can have. In fact, from kids to 66 and older have a fantastic time making the seed balls. And what you need to make seed balls is you need some red clay, this artist type clay, a bucket, some seeds, some potting soil, and a lot of aluminum trays that, that you use to, uh, to dry the seeds. The ratio that I use for making seed balls are four parts clay, one part potting soil, one part seeds, and approximately one part of water. The water part, you have to be careful because you don't want to add too much water to the, to the mixture or it'll be hard to make the little mud balls that you need to, to do with it. Uh, what I do is I mix the clay, the soil, and the seeds and then add water slowly until I get the composition of the, of the mud just right where I can make a little mud ball. Now, my preference for the seed balls is to roll them into a, a little ball three quarters of an inch in diameter. There's some that are half inch in diameter. There's some that are inch in diameter. If they get much larger than, than an inch, it's going to require probably a Hurricane Harvey to melt them. And the good thing about seed balls is they will sit in the prairie until it rains. And so when it rains, you get the rain, the water, and the sunlight, which seeds need to germinate. When making the seed balls, uh, I dry the seed balls as soon as I can using aluminum trays. And you will see me, I'll attend some of these luncheons where volunteers are hanging around. And I will be the guy after the aluminum trays where the barbecue and where the whatever else, cheese and whatever else comes in. 
And, uh, and the volunteers now know that they saved them for me. So I use aluminum trays all the time for that. Uh, once I finish drying them, I go ahead and store the seed balls in buckets until they can be tossed into the prairie. And I keep track of the seed balls by saying what, what, they are, what seeds are in them, uh, who made them, and the year that they made them. And so I, I go ahead and keep track of them like that. Here we have one of the volunteers that's making seed balls. And you can see once I have mixed the mixture and got it to the right texture, uh, I throw a gob of it where he's reaching for and he'll take a pinch of that. He'll run it in between his hands and he'll make a little seed ball and he'll put it in the aluminum tray. The people in the back ride are doing the same thing there. A seed ball kit will make about 300 to 350 seed balls. And so the number that you see here are probably two kits. I use the trays to dry the seed balls. And I usually dry them for about 10 days. And then I will go ahead and put them in a bucket so that we can use them later on. And it's a very easy thing to do. It's a very easy thing to manage. And I call these prairie in a pill because... They do have the seeds, they're self-contained, and you just chunk them in the prairie. So that pretty much ends the, uh, the making of the things. I wanted to give you a summary of the efforts that we have been doing. We have kept records since 2007 for the five facilities. Now, some of those facilities weren't around in 2007, but when they started, we keep records for them. Uh, we count grasses and forbs that are planted, volunteer hours, and acreage. We also maintain site inventories. And I generate a quarterly repair, report for these five sites that contains that information. We also keep track of the number of plants generated from seed. And again, it kind of tells us how we have gone from rescue to more of a seed-oriented facility. And just for my own information, I keep the number of plants that are purged. Now, the plants that I count is after they've moved to one gallon containers. I don't count seedlings. I don't count any of that. Uh, it's only after they have been potted in one gallon containers. And since I've been involved with the, uh, with the restoration activity, the volunteers have uh, generated and planted a total of 390,000 one gallon containers of grasses and forbs in these facilities. We have restored over 600 acres of prairie and in doing that it has taken over 72,000 volunteers hours. If you want to send me a question or something this is my email address and if you do send me a question, please put MPSOT on the subject line and then whatever else you want to put in there. And I will get back to you. Uh, I may not know the answer to your question, but there's a lot of experts, including people in your organization that know an awful lot, in fact, probably a lot more about these plants and the restoration activities than I do. Uh, we have one question from Susan, and she asks, what kind of seed are in the seed balls? Okay, you can vary that. Uh, I, I like to use um, uh, Texas coneflower. I have also used Baptisia, and, and I have used a, a grass mixture uh, in, 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 in the seed balls themselves. I also use basket flowers. You can practically use just about any seed you want to, except, I don't know if you remember those big seeds for the Eastern Gamma grass. That probably will not go very well in a seed ball, but you can just about use anything else that you want on there. Where can I purchase, obtain the seed balls? We don't sell the seed balls. But we do make them, and if you want to participate in a session where we make some, uh, we can probably set something up, and you can make your own, then we can dry them, and then you can take them. Again, everything that we do, it's volunteer, and we do not sell anything. We use it, or we give it away. 
depending on the site where the plant is generated, uh, we we do it in the in the name of restoration. So it's kind of like a freebie. What local plants do you feel are the happiest to grow in pots and most successful to transplant? Okay, uh, from from a grass perspective, uh, switchgrass, eastern gamma grass uh, are, are both a real good. Uh, uh, I use some intermediate grasses like uh, like uh, well, I counted as an intermediate like little blue stem, and also long spike trident. I use those are the grasses. As far as the blooming plants or the forbs, I find the ones that are the most fun to work with are coneflowers, Texas coneflowers. And this year I put some emphasis on ironweed and I was amazed how, how nice they grow and how good they look in, in, in one gallon container. Now we haven't really been planting ironweed too many in the field. So, uh, Probably later on, we'll try that and they'll probably move up in the list. But those are the ones that I, I really enjoy the most. One final question. Jim, great talk. Curious you. whether you do any planting in your own yard. Uh, actually, uh, I do have, uh, well, you couldn't say do any planting. I, I clean my seeds sometimes. At, in near the flower bed, and, and this year I had some uh, basket flowers growing in my flower bed in one of them. And as far as what I do grow in my garden is I have some seeds that I have planted. I've planted some Indian blanket, and someone gave me some uh, zinnias, which are not really considered a prairie seed, but I put some of those in but I really don't have too many, too many plants in my garden, although my wife is encouraging me to do that, and I am going to start doing a little bit more in that. But uh, those are the ones that I use right now. I probably have about seeds from 30 different plants that I have now available for germination and for planting. Thank you so much, Jim, for sharing your vast experiences and, and everything that you've uh, done to help with the prairie restoration.